Committed to fair debate and honest information, the Reality Check has arrived. RCR, Reality Check Radio. Now it's time for my favourite session of the week on RCR, a political agenda. Why is it my favourite? Well, I'm in it, of course. But the great company helps. Now this Friday, with Paul still out, having lost his voice, he's not here. But do not fear, Paul sent along his enforcer to make sure we keep on track and mostly, I think, to ensure that I don't speak too much. Welcome to The Breakfast Show, Tane Webster. Thanks, Cam. Glad to be here, filling in for Paul today. So welcome to author and commentator Olivia Pearson. Welcome to author Marty Gibson. Great to see your content on RCR's news blog recently. And of course, welcome to the one and only Cam Slater. On today's agenda, we've got a good mix of topics to cover. The recent Roy Morgan poll, uh, the recent chaos unfolding in France, Nigel Farage being debanked, a double dip recession ahead for New Zealand, five billion in extra borrowing, crown debt now at $73 billion. Teachers shocked at the draft school curriculum, NewsGuard launching in Australasia, and safer online services. And just before we get started, Paul has given me this buzzer (laughs) (laughs) to use to help us keep on time. So I will use the buzzer if necessary. First up, we have the Roy Morgan poll, and I think you're going to speak to that, Cam. Yeah, I'll kick it off. Uh, We had the Roy Morgan poll come out earlier in the week. Roy Morgan has a patchy reputation being up and down, and I don't tend to look at the exact numbers as they come out. What I'm looking at with polls is the trend on where things are heading. Now, Roy Morgan last month had Labour slash Greens with the Maori Party slightly ahead. This month they've got National slash Act um, slightly ahead, but neither of those two blocks have enough to govern by themselves. They will need another partner to come in. So the the headline numbers are um, the National Party is pretty much um, uh, flatlining or sliding downwards. They've dropped 1.5%. Um, they're only sitting on 30%. So we're 100 days out from the election and National is sitting at 30% and in second place. And Labor has uh, increased their support by 1.5%. Oh, no, no, sorry, that's ACT has increased their support by 1.5%. And they've gone up to 15%, which is the highest level of support for them in 18 months. Now, the National Party support is the lowest level of support for National since Christopher Luxon became the leader. The Labour Party um, is uh, sitting there uh, with slightly down on half a percent, sitting on 30.5, so just slightly ahead of National and the Greens have dropped 2.5% as well to 9.5%. And then there's really nothing else other than the Maori Party with a bizarre number, which is 7%. And I don't actually believe that. And I've prefaced that at the start. I don't look at the, the headline numbers. I look at the trends. And when you look at the chart for the Roy Morgan poll, um, you, what you're seeing is uh, the National Party, after Luxon took over, reached a high of 40%, and it's been downhill ever since then. Labor, too, is sliding, but the election of uh, Christopher Hipkins to the leadership has has dropped, dropped, jumped them up from 25% to 33%, and they've only dropped back from 33% there. So Luxon initially got a big jump, and then it slid away. Uh, Hipkins got a jump. And that's sliding away slightly. And we always see this in in most elections, especially post-MMP elections. You see the large parties sliding away in the last few weeks or or the last few months of the election campaign. And you see the minor parties coming up. And what we're seeing is ACT is cannibalising, absolutely cannibalising the National um, Party's vote. And David Seymour... um, as unstable and and as flippant and as arrogant as he is, is actually cutting Christopher Luxon's lunch here. And people are choosing ACT because they're looking at Christopher Luxon and they're thinking, gosh, you know, this guy is sweating woke and um, he is smelling of damp and he's just not resonating. And, you know, I get commenters on my site all the time. They're talking about 
Um, oh, well, no, we've just got a way. He's keeping his powder dry. He's keeping his powder dry. And, and I keep saying to them, look, this is a wet politician. There's no way he's keeping any powder dry. And it, it's just, he's just not working. But they're kind of stuffed because they've got 100 days. And right? that goes real quick, especially when yeah. the campaign gets going in, in – in you know great gusto in, in just a few weeks' time. And then you're going to start seeing some of these minor parties um, make a bit of a rally until they ebb away. You're, you're going to see Winston Peters come back. He's sitting on 3% there at the moment. That doesn't take much for him to get over that 5%, and then, then we've got a, a real game on our hands. Mm. Interesting, isn't it? I've said it before um, how, how correct it is that ACT are absolutely cutting the lunch of national and um, I have friends um, who shall remain unnamed, but they don't listen to the show anyway. Come um, on, it's Lindsay. No, 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 <laughs> um, no. Um, people that own a lot of property in commercial property and residential property all through Auckland, national voters for life, um, and they keep going on about how they're voting act for the first time, and the reason for that is simply. Um, and these people would put up with a lot more woke stuff than I would. Um, they're very late to the party, but they cannot bear the the spineless wokery that comes out of Christopher Luxon's mouth every five minutes. So they're voting act as if that's going to be anything too different. Well, you just have to look at that video. Marty, I know you saw it, that video of Christopher Luxon whining and carping about why he didn't go and speak to the parliamentary protest. Did you, did you see that video? Yeah, I, I, I saw that, and it's just – he's just a shiver looking for a spine to, to run up, isn't he, as, as the old <laughs> saying goes. And, and you know, there was that uh, Matthew – oh, not Matthew Hooten, uh, Mike Hosking just, you know, summed up what's going on with Labour as the simple equation is they look worn out and chaotic – we're in recession, crime is appalling, and there is dangerous malaise and growing anger around the running of the country, and they're still ahead of national. Mm. Yeah. Just appalling. Oh, Debbie Ngarawa Packer, uh, Packer or Parker? Packer. Um, Packer uh, pulled up the host of um, Wakahuia for saying that, uh, asking whether uh, the Māori Party was cannibalising uh, uh, <laughs> Labour's votes. Since it's a Pākehā thing, so oh really? I guess it's okay for us to say it, but yeah, it's not not the done thing in in the uh, Maori electorates. No, I guess not. Look, I've been saying this for uh, several months now, you know, to my to my readers that um, keeping your powder dry is not very good um, if you're going to be overrun by hordes and masses. Um, charging at you and you're sitting there going, it's all right, I've got my powder dry. It's all right, I've got... When you're overrun and your trenches are empty and you're all dead and the stocks of powder are still there, then there was no point keeping it dry. And if you're going to have your powder dry, it it pays to have a really good strategy, you know, (laughs) like a plan where you're going to deploy or, or, or put that dry powder in something and shoot it metaphorically speaking, of course. But that's a good point that you raised there, though, Olivia, because you have to have a plan and a strategy. And National's plan and strategy at the the end of last year was Jacinda Ardern's horrible and will be less crap than than they are, Mm. effectively saying that we'll be more careful managers of the decline. Um, And when she went, they've kept that plan. And Christopher Hipkins despite his history that we all know about and his anti-freedom stuff and all his vaccine stuff that he did, he's just not as despicable and loathed as Jacinda Ardern. So that plan mm. was th- should have been torn up and they should have started again. But they haven't. They've just carried on with this arrogant assumption that it's their turn next. Yeah, And it just, it just doesn't work. It didn't work for Bill English in 2002. It's our turn. Oh, they were terrible. Everyone will... It's just a, an aberrant. The arrogance of these major parties, and Labour has it too, the arrogance that they'll just swap around and have turns is unbelievable, but, you know, it's there. And But, but that arrogance comes from, you know, 100 years of exactly that happen, happening, the ball swinging from here and the, the pendulum, I mean, not the ball, back and forth, back and forth between, you know, a uni party basically. 
is it possible that they're just selling the same thing? I mean, you know, without wanting to inject too much cynicism in there, you know, I mean, if they really wanted to cane it, they'd do what it says on the box and go back to being national and, you know, focused on our national interest, which would be pretty easy to do. Well, they were there originally to fight communism, weren't they? Well, now they are communist. I think they're all implementing the same agenda. And, um, you know, I think that's why they don't open it right up and do what they would if they wanted to win. Convincing. Mm. Yeah, and as as it gets closer and closer to the election, these especially those two main parties, they're trying to compete to grab those centrist voters who are undecided because they know who the, their national voters are and Labour knows who their Labour voters are. So in the coming 100 days, it'll just be more of uh, more probably woke, woke stuff from Luxon competing for those middle voters. That's the um, You're you're absolutely right, except there's just one correction there. They're not competing for centre voters. They're competing for centre-left voters. (laughs) What they used to call the swing vote. Yeah. But they're they're decidedly on the left side of the centre. Right. Mm. They're they're not... National's no longer a right-wing party. It just No, they're centre-left. I see them very much as centre-left, yeah. All right, I think that's enough on the um, room. Oh, come on, we've we got to hear the buzzer. Oh, do you come now? On. Hear the buzzer. Hear the buzzer. <laughs> oh, please. Oh, there we go. Oh, fascist buzzer. <laughs> right, so now we're into the recent riots and chaos unfolding in France. I believe you're going to speak to that, Olivia? Uh, yeah, I'd like to speak to that. Um, basically, France, immigration, terrorism, censorship. That's the equation. Um, It's absolutely descending into hell. Um, The price Europe is now going to have to pay for mass Islamic immigration, despite the huge volume of painful warnings from people as far back as Enoch Powell, dare I mention his name, Um, and Roger Scruton, remember, was big on this issue. Um, Rest in peace, Roger. Um, and, and of course, more recently, Douglas Murray has made this point, especially in his book, The Strange Death of Europe, which is chilling. And, um, but after the mosque shootings here in New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern and Macron initiated the Christchurch call, which we know was a global effort towards censorship involving over 120 governments, their online service providers, um, and all their civil society organisations. Um, the Christchurch call was to target online terrorism and violent extremism. Um, When she and Macron initiated the Christchurch call, he was having to deal with the Yellow Vest protesters, um, which actually was a genuine grassroots working class protest movement protesting every single weekend um, in French cities all over France over petrol prices, uh, the rise of crude oil prices, um, fuel tax, uh, traffic enforcement cameras, they protested that, austerity measures, um, the 2017 wealth tax repeal. Basically, they were opposing all the fruits of neoliberalism in general. Um, they were livid that the tax burden of France fell heavily upon working and middle class people, um, while the super wealthy were, you know, avoiding their taxes, uh, taxes through clever accounting and offshore banking. Um, Macron gave orders for his heavily armed riot police to crack down on these protests so forcefully that one of the main leaders of the movement, Jerome Rodriguez, was shot by police in the face, resulting in the loss of his right eye. He was so badly wounded that he had to be placed in a medically induced coma. Um, Incidentally, that was a projectile from a flashball launcher. Um, exactly what Jacinda Ardern had the police use on we protesters when Freedom Village fell two summers ago. Um, Cam's often made that point that, you know, they were called sponge rounds where really they were... They're hard plastic. Yeah, but also from grenade launchers, right? Correct. Um, <clears throat> but the Christchurch call was there to, to well, she initiated it and him... Um, And it was used in our countries to censor social media posts about COVID and the vax. And Alex Antic made that really clear in the Australian Senate um, when he called out the the regulatory agency of the Australian government, the the TGA. Um, And 
you know, this is, yeah, this thing is different now. And you actually have got real terrorism, real Islamic hardcore violence. Um, and he's used the Christchurch call to now censor what's coming out of France and the media. I don't know if any of you other guys saw it, but it came through and it's now been censored. Um, some poor guy that protected his car and had his hand cut off. And he was lying there with his legs broken um, last week, you know, with his hand cut off, bleeding out, and some dick filmed him rather than putting it into a tourniquet. Um, but this is, France is just going to go off. Um, the only hope is that uh, Marine Le Pen um, picks up, well, well, steps in, um, and, and I don't know how that would happen other than that there's complete lack of uh, confidence in their president. I know she's sitting there waiting for this to happen, but she was always um, against the heavy immigration from Islamic countries into France, and this is the reason that she was against it. Where are they at now? Are they about 15% still, or are they getting up from that? Marine, I think she's a lot higher. No, no, sorry. The, the, what what percentage um, of the Muslim population is France now? Sorry, what was that question? Martin? Do you know what percentage um, uh, Muslims France is now? It was around 15%, <clears throat> wasn't it? I, I, I thought it was um, 10, actually. Yeah, I think it's a bit higher than that. Well, I know um, that you have serious threats to your culture when it's at six. Yeah, there's a scale of, of you know, we're, we're still at the they are us stage. Yeah, oh, God. Um, it's, in, it's, it's acknowledged in France to be around 10%, but the, that was last calculated in 2020. Right. right. The, other, um, the other politician that's been taking advantage of it in France, uh, other than Marine Le Pen, is uh, Eric Zemmour. Are you familiar with mm. him? Yeah, he's another what they call far right, but he's actually just a conservative politician. Yeah, he'd just be centre right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, a classical conservative. But, you know, <laughs> front, what I admire about the French, and there's not much I admire about the French. I mean, you know, their military prowess is just appalling, but their civil disobedience when they have had enough of their arrogant and out of touch elite politicians. Is incredible. You know, you you had the yellow the yellow vests, you know, protests. You've had farmers bring the whole country to a standstill. This is a whole different level mm. of of what we're talking about here. And you know, other European countries are probably sitting there, wryly smiling, like Poland and like Hungary, who absolutely refused to engage in the mass immigration that occurred and you know, 2018 to, to 2020 of all, all of these. It's, it's a lot. Well, Holland, Holland got that, of course. Hungary didn't. Yeah. It, 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 Hungary said there's no way. We're just going to put up fences and we're going to have minefields and we're going to have machine guns. We're going to have vicious dogs. Don't come here. The Poles did the same thing. Yeah, you, know, you want to go to Denmark? Keep on walking. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and they don't have these problems. Right, that Sweden has, that France has got, that all of these countries that said, "Oh no, we we love you all, we welcome you with open arms." Well, you you know, you're importing the problems that came from those countries. They bring them with them, right? These aren't families. Yeah. These aren't families that came in those mass migrations. They were fighting age people. Yeah. Right. They were they were eighteen to thirty five year old males that were invading literally, European countries. And that was so damn obvious when we watched that happen after after Hillary Clinton, Obama, and Samantha Powers, you know, managed to overthrow Gaddafi. Um, the floodgates just opened. He was always the cork to that bottleneck to the, to the Mediterranean. Um, and they've just, yeah, most of them fighting age males, freely flowing into Europe, the U.S., through the uh, southern border, which is ever porous. And, of course, Australia and New Zealand took ever larger refugee quotas um, as the Turkish and European camps were emptied. But what brought that to a halt in at least Australia and New Zealand was COVID. Yeah. Our border right. close. I think we better move on. And oh, we've got it's the Nigel of for... <laughs> it's only as a last resort, but okay. Oh, all right. Uh, we've got Nigel Farage debanking. Well, it's, it's debanking generally has uh, has been, and you've got to look at all of these things a, a, as a 
cumulative total of levers that are being assembled uh, to work against us eventually. It's naive to think that we won't eventually be de- debanked if uh, if we displease uh, the fat controllers. But, well, it um, happened yeah. to Lee Williams here, didn't it? Yeah, yep. well, I mean, it's, it, it's happened a lot. I mean, Nigel Farage, I mean, there's a bit of backwards and forwards about, uh, you know, whether Russia, Russia. He, he just got under the limit that they needed to keep his bank accounts open. But, you know, nine other banks turned him down. And he's a, a politically exposed person is the, um, is the phraseology they use. But, yeah, that happened in Canada as well with the trucking protests. And you had a pip. Um, a pip. Yeah. Yeah. Politically exposed person. What a terrible. It's, it's happening in America. J.P. Um, Morgan Chase um, basically uh, did a similar thing to the National Committee for Religious Freedom uh, over the past year. And, and um, basically they said to them, you can have your bank account uh, back. We'd, we'd potentially consider reopening your account if you take three actions. Disclose a list of donors who contributed more than 10% of your operating budget hand over a list of political candidates you intended to support and divulge the criteria you use to decide who to support politically. Oh, so, wow. you know, this is, and of course this happened to Katie Hopkins. Yeah. Um, Tommy Robinson. Tommy Robinson. It, it, and it's naive to think that it won't eventually happen to us. So it, it, has take- ha- it, you know, it has happened here. We've had Lee Williams, but go back even further, go back to 2014. And there was an attempt by the left wing to silence me, to cancel my advertisers, to take my money away from doing what I do. That was that was the start of all this. It's a eerie feeling, I would imagine, Cam. Um, you you feel oppressed yeah. when, when you go through it. But but what it made me do is to adapt, and it made me um, able to be more nimble on An early certain adopter. things. And yeah, and but I was forced into doing that. Thankfully, the banks weren't in that process now. But if there was dirty politics again, you can be, you can be without any doubt that I would have my bank accounts closed in a heartbeat. Yeah, you know? I mean, you know, the the other angle of this is is that, and, and I'm not sure whether it's in other countries other than France, but you would have seen that video of the president of the European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde. Yeah. Um, and she's a consummate insider. You know, she's been the president of the European Central Bank since about 2019. Prior to that, she was the president of the International Monetary Fund. She's also on the board of the Internet, Bank of International Settlements, the World Bank. She's on the board of the World Economic Forum. And uh, she was saying, uh, now in Europe, we have uh, this f- threshold above a thousand euros, euros, you cannot pay cash. If you do, you're going on the grey market, so you take your risk. If you get caught, you get fined or go to jail. So that's not very much. I've got friends in um, Europe who <clears throat> spend a lot more than that on a night out in cash. And, um, yeah, it's – It's um, it's getting it's hard coming. to use cash here. No, it's, it's here. It is getting very hard to use cash here. Mm. Uh, a, a mate of mine has a business that transacts. Um, financial products, and they've now had to stop accepting cash for some of these products that they're they're selling. They're, they're legitimate products. So I'm not going to say what they're because there's only a couple of them in business that do this, so I can't say what it is. But he's had to stop accepting cash in his business because it sets off all these triggers, form filling, um, you know, pencil necked weasels coming in with clipboards, coming to do audits. So, you know, why, how, why did you accept this much cash and stuff like that? Doe faces. Yeah, well, a good way to, to to look at it is to to remember those seven uh, aims of the World Economic Forum, and one of them is total control of transactions, transactions, through central yeah. banks, and digital currencies. And and you can you can look at what's in the paper and presented a certain way, and go, which one is it? Jacinda Ardern's going off to fight misinformation. Ah, that's the total control of the by the media cabal. Well, of, this is exactly what I, yeah, this is exactly what Ivor Cummins was talking about with me yesterday on 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 the same show. So he was saying that they are causing, you know, the, these uh, financial issues with with hyperinflation now starting to raise its head. 
you're having a collapsing of the financial markets. And then in part of this, we've got the WEF and all these other people talking about these um, CBDCs, talking about all of this sort of stuff, because that's the solution to the problem that they're causing. Yeah, so they're, they're, yeah. they've, they've, they've absolutely created. Solution. Yeah, and then when you, yeah. and you're right, Marty, when they couple that with censorship, with digital control of every transaction and what you're doing, now you've got the Chinese wet dream of a social credit system around the world where people like us can be othered very quickly and very comprehensively indeed. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I, I just I should say before we move on, it's not obviously just individuals that people should be aware of. It's um, even on targeting particular industries. I, I just checked an article from 2021. You guys might have heard it when it came around. In uh, Australia, there were banks restricting their uh, how much they would finance coal-related uh, companies because they've got a climate yeah. agenda and you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah it's it's been- whatever, the, whatever the cause celeb is of the left wing, because that's who's controlling this now. Well, yeah. is it though, Cam? I mean, I, I, I just it's 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 up. The, it's a big twisty rope, and right up the top, you've got politics mixed with business, which is fascism. And uh, you know, the the left wing, right wing. I mean, left wing's more government, less freedom. So I guess in that sense, they are left wing. Well, but, fascism's um, the corporate version of communism. Yeah. Well, if you yeah, think and, about and, and, Chris Chris Hipkins driving it, you know, his as I said, he's a he's a screen and a keyboard. You know, the CPU is uh, <laughs> is not in that sausage roll eating head. <laughs> yeah, and 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 but also through history, fascists. Well, especially the twentieth century, fascists, uh, communists, absolutely flocked to the fascist banner of the Nazis. That's what oh, happened. National socialists. Yep, national socialists. And but before we move on, just I just want to say one more thing. Um, I was very pleased to see Tommy Robinson um, rip uh, Nigel Farage a new one over the fact that he stayed silent when Tommy mm. uh, lost his bank accounts. And it wasn't just Tommy; it was his wife, it was his father-in-law, and that happened in two thousand and nine. Nigel Farage ended up piling on to the attacks on Tommy, calling him a thug and stuff like that. So Tommy told him off for basically told him not to sit there complaining like a bitch because his bank accounts have now, now been frozen. And good job, Tommy. Nigel deserves Yeah, that's a great it. point. We've, we've, we've yeah. got to stand up for the for the rights of the people, even if we disagree with the Absolutely. ideologies. 100%. Yeah, well, I stood up for Lee Williams when that happened to him, like him or not. What happened to him was disgusting in New Zealand, and he was hounded out of the country. And once you've got no bank account, that's it. No job, no bank account, no well, house, no it, marriage. They, they tried it with you, Olivia, remember? Well, they tried. They didn't get very far, though, Cam, because we had solidarity, didn't we? Well, uh, you had an editor that told them all to go away. Yeah, thank you for that. All Did right. Really the uh, next one to cover is Cam double dip recession ahead and government borrowing yeah the, these two things that go go hand in glove uh, they hit the news yesterday but nothing was i mean you know i go back to the Muldoon eras remember we used to have headlines in the news with the deficit was the record ever and you know everyone was saying this is terrible we've got these negative deficits and and all of it was just a desert now economic news comes out and everyone goes you know what what did Megan and Harry have to say about this? Or what? Oh no, Taylor Swift's not coming to New Zealand. We've we've completely dumbed down the information that people get upset about now. They get upset about a fat person can't fit into a chair in a plane, you know. And, but, <laughs> so what we've got now, though, we've got this double dip recession. That's what Kiwi Bank, you know, the the most illiquid bank that we've got in New Zealand. Is, their economists are sitting there saying. I think we're heading for a double dip recession. Well, a recession is two consecutive quarters in a row of negative growth. And a double dip recession is double that, obviously, which is a whole year of recession. The the next level that comes after double dip recession. Depression. Is depression. And that's two years of recessions. Basically, but it's it's a sort of a amorphous moving measure. 
But that's where we're heading for. And your talk with um, Fazi Irani was fascinating because, I mean, there's the Great Depression, which we know the history of that, and that was devastating, and that was before two world wars, well, one world war. Um, but this is, the, you know, you guys were referencing, well, Fazi was the co- complete collapse of the global system of economics and banking. Yeah. And that there's not even a word for that. No, and we, we've seen that several times. There was 1929, of course, and then there was uh, in the in the 70s with Henry Kissinger, which I talked about with um, with Iva, uh, yep. and we saw those two two interviews together, back to back, really like joined together a whole lot of information that was kind of interesting. Yeah, and you know we we now gone through those oil shocks, the things that Kissinger caused, the the oil shocks, the economic shocks that removed the gold standard and went to a total fiat currency uh, economy basis. And we're now coming, you know, this is what what Farzan was saying and what Ivor was saying, we're coming to the end of the era of the fiat currency um, uh, economies. And what we're going to see is another catalyst, and that's what they're talking about, this extra catalyst. And it all requires governments to be horrendously in debt so that they devalue their currency, they wreck the economy, they um, renege on on borrowings and all those sorts of things, which is why the second article that we're talking about here is linked to the double dip recession. Our recession is being caused by the government and our inflation is being caused by government spending. And the government spending is fueled by an addiction that Grant Robertson has to debt. And in the last quarter, they've whacked on an extra $5 billion of borrowing. And crown debt is now $73.73 billion. It's, mm. it's, it's getting close to, um, you know, to over the 20% mark of GDP and, and borrowings. And, and it's not like we've got a lot to show for it, is the other killer. We well, don't you have know, anything, for, anything talking about to show for it. Fiat currency. Do you think maybe the people are printing the money well, you know, quite like us, having well, borrowed a whole lot of money? and not have the pesky emissions. And again, you can go to that one to seven list about what the WEF wants. Exactly. They want to they wanna slow economies. And uh, so it's working just fine. You know, it's not a fe- It's not a bug, it's a feature. It's a feature. And you're right. I mean, but, but let's put this into perspective. You remember in 2017, part of the coalition agreement between Labor and New Zealand First was the $3 billion um a provincial growth fund, and everyone threw their arms in the air and said, this is an appalling waste of money. $3 billion is terrible. Well, the government's just gone and borrowed an extra $5 billion in the last quarter. Mm. Right? That, that's nearly double what the whole of the provincial growth fund was supposed to be. And yeah. there's, not, there's no outrage over that. You've right? almost got to say it a different way. I used to, in the 10 years before I left Gisborne, it had $10,000 million from central government. And still had the same rates of illiteracy, still had the same presence of gangs, still had the same bumping along in last place, you know. And you think you have to sort of tie yourself in knots to spend that much money without actually changing anything. Well, well, you know, you just look at the mental health budget. The government touted, you know, in 2020 that they were going to spend. $1.9 $1.9 billion on mental health and was going to be wondrous and was going to solve the problem and we wouldn't have any more mental people on the streets and it was going to be cool. What do we get for that? We've spent it. It's gone, right? $1.9 billion has been spent on mental health. And there health. are mental people everywhere. Everywhere, right? They're yeah, living I'm in not, motels in Rotorua. <laughs> They're living in motels in Rotorua. You, know, uh. you go for a walk along the main street of Takapuna, there's beggars on the main street of Takapuna, people who are begging aren't, uh, are doing it because of mental health issues, not because of other, any other reason. Right? In, so, in my first uh, year at uni, um, I, I didn't get into the halls of residence and, and my mum found a, a, a cheap uh, hostel nearby. And it turned out that it was where all the Tokunui patients went when they, um, when they shut it down. And, um, and uh, you know, a lot of them, I mean, it was a pretty good place for them, really. It was a bit of a sense of community. But mm. the fact that they were such awful places before shouldn't necessarily put us off having a place where they can go and live. Mm. No, it's, no, it, I, it was an absolute mistake closing down mental institutions. I mean, I had a 
brother-in-law that ended up in Tokunui. He sadly took his own life at 23, but he was in Tokunui. Um, it was when he got out that he hung himself. Um, but those places actually just, they kept them clean, they kept them medicated, and they, you know, had some form of um, respite from parental care because, I mean, he was, that was quite advanced schizophrenia. It was very sad. Um, and also, I remember Ravensthorpe Hospital in Ramarama, Auckland. I mean, South Auckland, that was, you know, um, you wouldn't want to live there or anything, but they were severely um, mentally ill people that were not capable of living in society at all. Um, and at least they were cared for and medicated to some degree of, you know, and they had little gardens and well, things like that. Well, at least like they that, could that, work too before they said, oh, you've got to pay them the minimum wage, you know. Yeah, but so letting them wander around the street. That's yeah, what they, Helen Clark, she did that. She was the health minister that closed yeah, all of those mental that, hospitals. That down was Helen, that. Helen yeah. back, Helen back. <laughs> we don't need the buzzer. I think we've finished that one. Yeah, right. Let's move on to uh, the draft science curriculum that's recently come out. Olivia? Yeah, so, oh, well, you know, um, schools are now being designed to directly dumb the next generations down so that they are too incompetent to be able to ever run complex infrastructure. No science in the curriculum, physics, chemistry, biology, um, is out. Um, the article that's come through that I, well, the articles that I've been reading, um, you know, um, the Institute president, Joaquin Brand, said that he was worried teenagers would finish school without learning fundamental knowledge about things like energy and matter. It's not a bug, it's feature. It yeah. doesn't matter, bro. He warned the draft was, <laughs> this is the thing though, is he warned that the draft was heavy on philosophy and light on actual science. Um, I don't like seeing science be pitted against philosophy in that way. I think that's a, a terrible mistake and a really dumbed down mistake. Um, philosophy is the handmaiden of science, always was. Science was called natural philosophy for, you know, until the late 19th century when chemistry and physics became separate disciplines. Um, watching just what entities do and how they act upon or how they are acted upon seemed more and more to have little to do without, with anything philosophical. So philosophy and science sadly got a divorce, um, which is a real shame. I mean, I've got a lot more to say on that, but perhaps one of you guys want to chime in to actually the articles on what happened There's a good here. article um, uh, in yesterday's paper by Dr. Andrew Ro uh, Rogers, who's the head of chemistry at St. Peter's College in Auckland. And it's good to see, you suspect people are just starting to get a little bit brave. You know, he's, he's speaking out and um, he, um, he said, it, it reinforces my worry that the science programs are, are being dumbed down, best practices being ignored, and the changes are being dictated by ideology. Of more concern, those who worked on the level one science standards did so without any idea what the level two or level three programs would look like as mm. no curriculum existed. Um, yeah, yeah so many of the experienced classroom specialists with an understanding of in international best practice were sidelined or at best managed. I suspect they were seen as difficult to work with because their reasoning didn't support the ministry's narrative. God. And, Let's and just call it what it is, though. Right? This, this isn't about science. This isn't about anything other than indoctrination about climate change, species yep. extinction, veganism and bugs, renewables and pandemics. That's what this science so-called science curriculum is all about. It's about indoctrination. And then when you add the indoctr indoctrination, the cultural Marxism that's marched through our institutions, our learning institutions, is then applied to the censorship and the censoriousness of our modern governments and now linked to these controls of, of banking and all of this. What you're looking at is not dumbing people down, it's making them compliant. But we already know that most New Zealanders are compliant because they all just tug their forelocks and Yeah, we saw that, didn't we? We saw that, right? We were sitting there laughing, but what we were actually watching was the the test run for subjugation. Yeah, a toe yeah. in the water. 
Michael Johnson from the New Zealand Initiative um, blew the whistle on the, the draft document after it was leaked to him. So this is from a leak, right? Um, but one of the curriculum writers, one Kathy Bunting, rubbish suggestions uh, that key areas, key areas of physics and chemistry would not be taught. She said, absolutely not, but they will be teaching the chemistry and the physics that you need to engage with the big issues of our time. Um, well, I mean, stuff that. The big issues of our time, for them, that means men can become women, right? And they're going to turn that in. Well, they have turned that into well, a science. Also, it also means that carbon, the thing that actually makes us up as human beings, is evil. Is evil. So, yes, how dare right. you How dare you love your life when you're just carbon? How well, evil. I mean, ba basically, this curriculum is this, right? The Earth system, that's the headline they've called it. Essentially, it's climate change and how it's destroying the Earth and how only Ma Ma Tauranga Maori can save the planet. That's what the that's what the curriculum will be. Biodiversity. Yeah. How yeah. climate change is reducing biodiversity and how colonialism killed off everything and then they blame the Maori for it. Yeah, so we that'll, can, that's that'll what be, it'll be. That'll be the big issue, one of the big issues of our yeah. time that she's speaking about. And you know, science, physics, chemistry, biology, in other words, natural philosophy, um, you know, should be about the big issues of any time. Not this, you know, universal truths, not just our own hermetic little cultural bandwagons. Yeah. Um, Bunting's language and pedagogy makes me sick. Um, what the world needs now is an emphasis on morality connected to science. You know, what is right and wrong? Um, not as an end goal. I don't mean morality as an end goal, but as a tool to make sure that you get to the good and fruitful human flourishing. Um, but we know human flourishing is not a goal anymore for these people. Hence, the curriculum reflects that. Yeah, excellent. I mean, I can just imagine the infectious diseases curriculum will be how Jacinda Ardern saved the world from COVID and why we now must give full pandemic control to the United Nations. That'll, yeah. be, the, that'll be what it is. It'll yeah. be all of that. And also, you know, I want to say this, parents have to mount a full-scale organised revolution against their school administrators or they need to go and homeschool, and that's probably a better option. Um, even I had three years of homeschooling. Um, we got science, biology, logic, poetry, music and politics and animals everywhere, and it was just absolutely amazing because my mother started a school in her own home. Um, she was a teacher, um, but it was the stuff of a good classical education, yeah. and there is no reason. I mean, that school is still thriving. It's on the North Shore called Westminster. Um, I was a foundation pupil. Um, but, Cam, you'll remember this national national government back then in the – uh, late 80s, um, started to bulk fund new schools with a code of special yep. character. Yep. Um, so my ma, she taught up to 20 kids in her own middle-class suburban home, right, in Campbell's yep. Bay, bef and um, didn't take a salary for five years, banked all the bulk funding, and then went and bought 10 beautiful acres 10 years later in Albany and built yeah. her school yeah. um, with a Christian worldview um, for their pedagogical Fantastic. Approach. Yeah, and there's no reason um, why um, I keep saying this to people who are teachers and have been disenfranchised after COVID. There's set no up your reason. own school. You've got to set up your own school. And, I mean, school fees, I, I would pay $1,000 a term for that for my child. Um, you know, you get so, so that equ equates to four grand a year. I mean, that's kind of doable if you if you if you make it so. And you can get we mum had people come in from with philosoph philosophy degrees that came and taught us Solon's reforms, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the the beginnings of Western thought. Um, we got taught that at eleven years old. You were hot housed. We were. It proves it works. Yeah, I did it. My brother chose not to. The, um, the teachers' unions, of course, oppose all of this and because they want everyone to be dolts so that they can keep teaching dolts, which make more dolts, which make useful union members. Yeah. Well, they're upset that someone else might be able to do the job better than them. Well, just about everybody can do the job better than them. 
But people used to ask my mother, you know, how do you get around homeschooling with the curriculum? Because this this was all done because people like my mother found the school curriculum bloody disturbing back in the 80s. It was if it was bad in the 80s. Imagine what it's like now. They're teaching them all sorts of mumbo jumbo that boys can be girls and girls can be boys. Well, so yeah, I mean it's a it's a huge issue. (laughs) Your fascist buzzer. Yeah. Oh, Tane. Oh. So, right, so now we're going to move into NewsGuard's launch into Australasia. Can you tell us about that, Marty? What is NewsGuard? What's the significance of this development? Well, NewsGuard is is basically a um, – it, it's a third owned by one of the world's largest PR firms, and it's essentially a filter that um, that uh, filters out wrong think and wrong speak. <laughs> so this is this is all – again, this is all linked in. If you don't have an educated population, they don't know what's missing from the information they're getting. And, um, you know, this is also um, linked to the new, um, the, the uh, changes to the online um, safety, the Department of Internal Affairs. Um, what's it called, Cam? Help me out here. Dart, cert, all of those the, ones? Yeah, all, all of that stuff. You know, we, we've got, Government these, snitches. Yeah, these bodies established. Busy to, bodies. Internal yeah, Affairs Department. To cut out the debate, essentially. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's just and, censorship, is what it is. Yeah. Marginalize any nail that sticks up so it can be hammered down. Um, when you're holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah, when you're good at hammering. <laughs> um, but I mean, I. I I, I, I did uh, make the excuse that I've had five kids charging around the, the house and I've been reading through all the stuff and it's so dense, you know, and, and you can read a lot of it and it, it, um, it doesn't sound bad. Like if you, if you read um, a lot of the, um, what the Department of Internal Affairs says about it, it says it sounds very, very, um, very, very uh, mild and, and harmless. It, uh, but it, you know, it says in essence. Um, it sounds like it's good for you, right? Yeah, it, it you keeps need you this. safe. Yeah, and it's going to keep you all safe. You know, where have we heard that before? The same place that we heard that the WEF's great, cons- you know, reset was yeah, a conspiracy safer online theory. services. Safer, yep. safer, yeah. than, safer than what? So it sounds like the digital identity trust framework bill. Safer online services. Yeah, so they're, they're, it it's designed I mean, the, to protect people like Russell Brown, you know, the tech guru who fell for a scam the other. I, sorry, I just had to insert that. I just <laughs> laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed when I saw Russell Brown doing a pity party about how him and his nana and his mum nearly got scammed. <laughs> well, well, this this um, I mean, I know I'm jumping around a bit, but the um, the it's just your papers. Out, yeah, too many papers. Yeah. Um, Shuffle them so we can hear them. Show us yeah. your papers, the, the Marty. New, the NewsGuard service is basically launching in Australia and New Zealand now, so it's been it's been in the pipeline for a fair while. Um, it's been tested in the states. It, it's it's heavily left leaning. Um, you know, it, it um, gave all the people saying that the Hunter Biden laptop story was was a, a Russian misinformation <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, program a, a big pass and and. Uh, deducted marks off Fox for saying that it wasn't, uh, never really altered them back. But, um, and now it's also um, feeding into what the AI stuff's doing. So it's a social credit system for news. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Have you you seen those um, experiments people did where they, they, um, they said white people are bad because, and it wrote, wrote a big essay on the evil of uh, of white people. And then if you try the same thing with black people, it says, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, like um, there's ones like, are you proud to be, am I am I allowed to be proud of my, this heritage yeah, versus that heritage yeah. and stuff? That, that little filter's already in AI. They've all, they couldn't help themselves. See, I'm yeah. in big trouble when it comes to that because, a lot of my heritage is Scottish, which of course is, well, they're just a mixing pot of, you know, Vikings and Romans and mad cat macadas. 
Yeah, and and you know ginger people and and even um, Spaniards. You know, there's I qualify as what's called a, a black Scot. They call them that. They're people who are descended from uh, Spanish Armada sailors who came ashore when, yeah. when the ship sunk. Right, and so yeah. we've got curly hair and olive skin, and everyone goes, "Where'd that come from?" Well, it came the, from no, Spaniards. but the Celts had that dark hair, dark eyes. It's a very prominent feature in a lot of Celts. Yeah. So, you know, that's when people start talking about, oh, you know, colonialism. That's just a tiny blip in the in dot of, you know, even if you're talking about Anglo-Saxon heritage, that's well after the Romans and well after the, you know, the the Celts and well after all the other, you know, tribes that all got disappeared by yeah. the Romans and things like that. There's, there's no such thing as this white, it's just bollocks. But, it's total bollocks, yeah. Well, you know, some, something I'm fond of saying is, uh, and this is c- completely off the uh, off the news guard thing, but um, uh, women thought that the uh, CIA and the and the Rockefellers were doing them a big favor sponsoring feminism, but what they were sponsoring was division and demoralization of the most Hatred likely of men. opponent. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, I I sort yeah, of nudge Maori and say maybe they're kind of doing the same thing to you, bro. No, because the patriarchy look- won that though, because now we in- introduce transgenderism, and that's the patriarchy taking back feminism. <laughs> well, it's certainly gone gone to war with it, right? <laughs> that's why I just laugh at all these women that are out there sticking up for these, you know, transgender athletes, saying that you know they they deserve to be able to compete with other women and all this sort of. They're just cutting their own throats, and they just don't realise what they're doing. But I, I laugh at women. Uh- protesting the use of fossil fuels you know no feminism without fossil fuels ladies oh dear no washing machines yeah. um yeah look i i didn't take any notice of the trans uh uh rubbish you, you know i for ages i just wave i would not look at that problem that was a because, mistake for us to do that you know that eh? to, to look away yeah yeah. To say, oh no, that doesn't affect me. I'm not worried. No, that no, but one of, the re- one of the reasons that I really didn't want to go there was because for the last 50 years, we've watched women do this to men, like completely grind them down. And now, and then the trans thing came in, and, you know, their targets were women, and women got a little bit of a taste of their own medicine, especially feminism. Um, but anyway, I've had to alter my view now because I can see how diabolical this has been. Um, but, you know, women didn't help themselves by um, taking on all this patriarchy nonsense. I mean, I've never been a feminist. I never will be. I never want to be. I don't think it's a glorious um, label at all. You weren't even a third wave feminist? No, none of it. I, You know, I like men too much um, on, on the whole. I mean, some of them are pigs and stupid, deeply stupid. Yeah, but true. I've always been treated yeah. very well by men. I mean, that's been my good luck. Men are great. Yeah. Yeah, I awesome. mean, if you look at the list of things that um, Jacinda Ardern wanted to uh, include in the hate speech legislation, it was basically everything. Mm. Right. Age, um Sex, so she'll, you know she'll get what she wants. She's got this global thing now, you know, swanning around, you know, tut tutting and wagging. Special a envoy, and special envoy for for head waving and arm flapping. A special envoy for the Christchurch call. Yeah, Very what time. is this Christchurch call? It sounds that sounds like some sort of rare bird that's no, it's and flaps religious its wings. cam yeah. call. If you look at the use of the word call, it's the call to prayer. And it's, 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 they like to imbue this sort of stuff with the trappings of religion because it is kind of standing in for religion. Yeah. Kind of I getting in the way of God. It's absolutely taken over religion. The Christchurch call came to your point, being some sort of squawking, be coined, be coined, be coined, be coined. <laughs> you, can hear it in, you can hear it in the morning. You can hear it at sunset. <laughs> you can hear it as you're going off to sleep as well. It's a ubiquitous, you know. Rare, hardly ever seen. Be coined. <laughs> In my mind, right, folks. Should we should we wrap up? Do you have any closing thoughts for this for the show? Marty was just about to say something epically profound. I just know it. Look, you yeah. know, I mean, it's tough to um, it, it's tough to look at it. It's it's you know, when a whole lot of blind people are feeling different bits of elephant, an elephant, and and they're describing what they see. Uh, yeah. You know, and it sounds like a whole lot of different things. 
And, and so, you know, these things that we've kind of just skipped over, you know, the, the, um, the news filter, the review of, of the online safety stuff, being able to stop your bank accounts, they're all connected. It's the in, slowing in, down of the economy. It reminds me. Oh, they're very connected. Useless, hapless opposition. It reminds me of that little joke we used to have when we were kids, you know. How many elephants can you fit in a mini? And you'd say four, you know, two in the front, two in the back. And you'd say, how do you know there's an elephant in your, in your fridge? Oh, there's a footprint in the butter. All these things are footprints in the butter, right? <laughs> Leading up to us, you know, after the third elephant's in the fridge, we can't shut the fridge door anymore. And how do you know there's four elephants in the fridge? Well, because there's a mini parked outside. And that's when we're going to realize that all of these little footprints in the butter, the things that Marty just raised, that Farzan was talking about, that Iva were talking about, and all these people that are talking about are the footprints in the butter. But the reality is there's a mini parked outside with four elephants in it. What are we going to do? Well, I'm a hunter, and I know what you do with elephants. <laughs> Uh, par parallel communities, Marty, they really matter. Parallel communities. Yeah, yeah no, then that doesn't mean 15-minute cities. No, I mean, the, the idea, the Voices for Freedom, when they originally came out and they got hammered for this, but they were completely correct, and it's we must be ungovernable. Yeah. Yep. We have to learn to say no. You, you know, you need to stay at home. No. You need to wear a mask. No. Not doing that. You have to take this vaccine. No. Right. You need to um, comply with this arbitrary rule. And then when you have complied with it, it's not going to be good enough because we would have changed it. No, we're not doing that. We have to learn to say no. Yeah. We have to say that over and over and over again to these politicians. They I only could, ever react when you smack them in the face. I could um I could I could make a lot of money um, teaching people how to stand up and say no. I mean, it comes quite natural to me. Perhaps that should be my next book. Well, I was a change manager for a bank, and I learned to say no every time a, pro a programmer tipped up at my desk with a change form. No. <laughs> There's a great virtue in being able to say no, get stuffed. Well, that's why I had the job, because I just say, I didn't care. I just said no, we're not doing that change. Yeah. Schedule it. And you can't, how do you parent children without going no. no, that's nonsense. No, be quiet, leave the room. Yeah, so well, your nine-year-old says, I want to be a girl dad. Yeah. No, don't be stupid. Go to your room. <laughs> yeah. But no, what the parents do now is, that, oh, okay, oh, I need to understand you. Okay, well, how about you take these drugs? Yeah, It's, or, it's madness. Oh, no. my goodness, let's all go to counselling and we'll talk no. about it together. Mm. No. <laughs> mm. how about I think that's a great way to end it. That's how we stop the agendas. We just say no. We just say no. Yep. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for a wonderful episode of uh, the political panel. Thanks, Tane. Thank, thank you, Tane. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back with a gong next time or yeah, a kazoo, say, maybe a kazoo. A thank you, Tane, but I never want to hear that fascist buzzer again. <laughs> I have this. An electrode wired directly to camera. I like that. That's much better. Oh, much better. Oh, that's, that's a beautiful sound on the ear. Yeah, that's soothing. That, that would make us stop because we'd just pause. Why didn't you use that reflect. all the way through? Well, normally I try to get permission before doing anything off the plan, but, yeah. I like that. Should have just trusted, uh, should have just trusted my instincts. Got to get over that too. Tane, you need to understand something, right? It's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. Okay, okay cool. See, see you later. later. Bye. Bye. Committed to fair debate and honest information, the Reality Check has arrived. RCR, Reality Check Radio.